Okay, so I've begun um, recording. I'd like to welcome everybody to the 2024 Invention Gala, Public Invention Gala Award Ceremony and Fundraiser featuring Dale Doherty. Um, I've got a lot of material to cover very quickly, so this meeting doesn't take too long and to get to Dale's talk. So uh, there will probably be a lot of questions that I can't answer. So please send me email at read.robert at if you have any questions. Um, what we'd like to do today is uh, talk about what we as an organization are trying to do, then talk about what we did specifically in the year 2023. And then the most important thing we're doing today is to give out our public invention awards to our volunteers who, who have worked very hard, um, mostly with no compensation except our appreciation. And then um, the famous Dale Doherty who created Maker Fair and Make Magazine is here and he's gonna give a uh, talk to us and we'll have a Q&A period and then I'll ask for your financial support. I'll quit recording uh, when I do that. So um, the motto of public invention is to invent in the public for the public. And that means we make open source hardware inventions for all humanity um, for the public. So to me, public invention is a natural evolution of the humanitarian thought of Benjamin Franklin, Nikola Tesla, Jonas Salk, Buckminster Fuller, and Richard Stallman. The free software movement birthed open source hardware and influenced the maker movement. The maker movement gave birth to open source invention of which public invention as an organization is just the vanguard. In the last century, profitable firms and universities have been the uh, two most important pillars of human progress. Um, what we hope is that in the next century, public invention will be a third alternative. It seeks neither profit nor monopoly, and it doesn't make you take an entrance exam like a university does. We are seeking a noble bright future in which the act of technical invention itself will be freely given to all humanity. Today, 750 million people do not have electricity. Public Invention believes that nobody can be left behind in human progress. We can only explore the stars together in peace if we make all of us a success. Public Invention, therefore, seeks to do this by inventing in the public for the public. Um, this year, we completed a number of projects which are now on sale um, in our system uh, at our website. And I'm going to be talking about that. The Ventmon, the GPAD, the Polyvent, the Glia injection molded tourniquet, and then we're going to talk about the projects that are still ongoing. So um, the first thing is the Ventmon, um, which I, I have in my hand here. And Ben Coombs from New Zealand um, uh, made this much smaller. So what he did is he made this footprint much smaller. This is an IoT-enabled spirometer that was used during the pandemic to test ventilators, but can also be used to test human breath. And it's an example of the kind of electronic gadgets that, that we make. Um, Lee and Lawrence, who are here, built the general purpose alarm device, which flashes very bright lights and makes really loud, annoying noises um, and produces a little bit of text for the purpose of alerting you um, when something has gone wrong. It was designed for the polyvent ventilator, but it can really be used as a programmable alarm for anything. Um, in 2023, we finished the polyvent. Um, we are currently writing up the complete open source design of this ventilator. It's a complete resource or research and educational ventilator that could be the basis of locally made open source medical ventilators. The Ventmon, the GPAD, and the polyvent all together are available for sale on our website, and they, they form the system that we call Free Spirico. So th this is a photo montage of all the people who were part of the Polyvent project, which was created by Nathaniel and Victor outside of public invention, but then became a public invention uh, project. And it may be that that project is winding down. An enormous amount of work went into the Polyvent. Um, Unfortunately, no one has really picked it up yet. No one has built on our work or approached us about trying to move it forward. Uh, but we're making ourselves available and we're documenting everything so that somebody can do it in, in the future. Another project that we, we finished um, is shown here. This is a photograph of the glia injection molded tourniquets that, that are actually being made in Poland right now for Ukraine. 
So Public Invention as a US 501c3 raised $37,000 as a fiscal sponsor for GLIA, a Canadian nonprofit, to make open source desktop injection molded systems for the GLIA tourniquet design. Um, this is, like I said, is being made in Poland right now. Um, probably the first life saved by public invention will be through GLIA, not through something that we're making, but we're trying to make very um, abstract inventions. We have a lot of ongoing projects as well. Um, these are global distributed tracking, which we're not gonna have time to explain today, but we're gonna touch on the NASA ceramic oxygen generator uh, digital control system, which is um, a very important part of what I personally did last year. The Moonrat portable incubator, which is led by Melanie with the assistance of Lee Erickson. The ferrofluid check valve, um, which I think is really an interesting invention. Um, we're also working on some smaller projects, the GPAD 2.0, adding Wi-Fi and speech to that and embedded botanical sensing. So global distributed tracking is probably going to be the main project we work on in 2024. And it's a software only project, which is technically independent of public invention. Um, GDT is currently fiscally sponsored by public invention and public inventors, people from public invention are, like myself are working on a lot. It already has a working um, minimum viable product. Um, it uses light cryptography to provide free tracking of chain of custody and quality documentation to fight global counterfeiting. So um, based on our collective experience um, from open source medical supplies and other allied organizations, what the world really needs is a way to track the provenance or history of something to make sure that it's not counterfeited in a way that doesn't require people in other countries who don't know us to authenticate. That is, we know people in Tanzania are not going to have a login to a system produced in the United States. There's just no way they have the time, the internet access, the language skills to get a password and authenticate whenever they want to document something. So instead, we've built a cryptographically strong system by which using only their phone without revealing their identity, they can add to the history of a moving object as it's distributed. We believe this ease of use will be extremely important. Um, so there really is no competitor at all to global distributed tracking. Um, it's completely free to use requires no authentication. Um, it is append only in the sense that you can't tamper with anything because we don't allow you to edit any of the old data. The data is completely encrypted. It's open source and requires no downloads. So um, we believe this is an ideal solution for the kinds of places where people are worried about their identity because they're in a conflict zone and, or where you have very limited access, but people have smartphones. Um, these are the global distributed um, tracking volunteers. Um, it was not by design, but it just so happens that they're all women except for Harry Pearson and, and myself, which is just kind of a happy accident. Um, now I'd like to talk about the ongoing uh, projects at Public Invention. So the um, medical oxygen is a life-saving miracle drug that we in the West take for granted. In many low-income countries, in rural places, especially far away from population centers, the supply of oxygen is spotty. Um, and if you don't have oxygen and you need it, your chance of dying is, goes up tremendously. And this, this includes for children who um, often die of childhood pneumonia. Now, uh, NASA, the National uh, Aeronautics and Space Administration of the United States government, um, has for years supported a revolutionary solid state technology that uses no moving parts to extract oxygen from the atmosphere. Um, they call this ceramic oxygen generation. The chemistry for this is being done by a startup in Utah called American Oxygen. Um, public Invention did not do the chemistry of it, but we did build the um, uh, digital control system that you see pictured here. So this work was done with um, uh, Lawrence Kinchlow, Jeff Mulligan, and Lee Erickson, who, who are pictured here. 
Um, we actually did $100,000 worth of work for NASA before the contract was canceled. Uh, contract was not canceled because of anything that we did, but because the US Congress hasn't passed a budget. Um, so this is an ongoing project that is really exciting in terms of the number of lives that could be eventually uh, saved by this. Um, the Moonrat Portable Incubator is a battery powered incubator for doing E. coli water analysis in the field, far away from reliable electrical power. Now, um, Melanie Laporte pictured here is leading a team in Guadalajara um, who are also pictured below here, coached by Lee Erickson. So the idea here is to make a small battery powered object that we can take into the field um, uh, in you know relatively harsh environments where you don't have reliable electricity. And I, I took the previous version before Melanie joined the team to Tanzania with me and we actually did water analysis there. Um, this is for the kind of water analysis that is able to detect fecal contamination. And of course, fecal contamination due to cholera and other transmitted diseases, is one of the main causes of human death, especially among young children uh, in the developing world. So it's a relatively simple uh, gadget, but um, it really could be a big lifesaver. Um, we're also working on some smaller projects. Um, the gentleman on the left is Benny Skirde. Uh, he and I are working on in, an embedded botany sensor with the help of Lawrence Kinchelow. Um, uh, the young woman, Naram Kier, is working on the wireless general purpose alarm device, the second version of it, which will um, make the GPAD device, which I, I have here, even more valuable because it will um, include wireless ability and speech production ability. And then finally, Joe Hirschberger, who's with us today, um, and also Sid Cho, have been working with me on the passive ferro fluid check valve, which is intellectually one of our most interesting inventions. It's an it's an actual one way valve that consists of nothing but ferro fluid in a magnetic field, and um, it took me a long time to develop it, and uh, before. Uh, it was created, I'm not sure many people would have thought it that it was possible to, to build such a thing, to build a, a one-way fluidic diode using nothing but a, a fluid. Um, so now I'd like to do the most important thing that we are here for today, which is to honor our contributors um, by giving them an award. And those of you who are here uh, I don't have time to let everybody speak because um, we're giving out quite a few awards. But if you're here and you've got your plaque, you can hold up your plaque or um, come off mic and say hello uh, as, I, as I call out your name. So the, the first person I'd like to recognize is Megan Cadena, um, who is a, a paid staff member. Um, she's actually considering going to medical school. She's been in charge of our website, social media, um, outreach and grant research. And uh, she's public convention really depends on her. So I want to thank Megan for being here. Um, second and uh, first place for best paid staff contribution goes to Miriam Castillo, who's also here. Um, Miriam has been handling the recruitment of people um, in 2023, and she's really learned how to do it. And there she is with her beautiful green plaque up, held upside down. Uh, um, she's learned how to use LinkedIn to really recruit effective volunteers. And that means a great deal to us because after all, public invention is fundamentally about volunteers coming together to form teams to work on humanitarian inventions. So thank you, Miriam. Um, Dr. Abidi is here. She's a professor at Rice University and public invention is giving her most active board member second place. We, we could have given her best technical paper because she's the first author of a paper that Nathaniel and I presented in Baltimore uh, with Dr. Abadi at the American Society of Engineering Education around the polyvent ventilator. Um, and so uh, we really appreciate that. One of the things that we always try to do at Public Invention is to be a bridge between what you might call amateur making and uh, peer-reviewed publication. So not everything that we do ends in or deserves a peer-reviewed publication. 
but you know we're very serious about the inventions that we're trying to make. So we aim for a peer-reviewed publication. And in the case of the Polyvent, um, we got a publication as an educational device. Um, next, I'd like to present a uh, most active board member to Victoria Jacqua, um, who is here tonight. Uh, she's really a ball of fire and has done a great deal um, for public invention. Um, she assisted with the GLIA tourniquet project. I probably don't know everything she's done for GLIA. She and I have written some essays together and she's one of the co-leads, along with Christina Cole, of Global Distributed Tracking, which is really a flagship of what public invention is working on. Now, it's not technically a public invention project because it's uh, we've spun out a California corporation. So it's, it's a little confusing, um, but it's a big part of what public invention is working on. So thank you very much, Victoria. Um, I created a new category this year for best design evolution. And I can hold up to the camera, the Ventmon. This is an IoT empowered spirometer. So this can be used for measuring human breath or a vent ventilator. And we, med we made this as a ventilator tester at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. But Ben Coombs, uh, who worked on it, produced it, made it much smaller and put it in this beautiful little form factor um, and made some other improvements to it. So we really want to thank Ben for doing that. He's in New Zealand, so I don't know if, if he's going to be here tonight. And we have Christina Cole, who's probably here. Um, Public Invention would like to present her with breast presentation for Maker Fair Bay Area 2023. Uh, Christina and I presented global distributed tracking to an audience of about 25 people, I think it was there, maybe fewer. Um, in San Francisco, and it was really interesting. We staffed a table there for two days, which was um, very exhausting because I spoke to probably 60 really informed, skeptical, but intrigued makers who really understood cryptography about the global distributed tracking um, system. And we left that with a great validation that it's a project that the world really needs and, and makes sense. So I want to thank Christina for doing that. Um, next, we have uh, two awards, second place and third place, for best technical uh, paper. So Dr. Eric Schultz, who's an obstetric anesthetist in Australia, um, developed a new explanation of something that's really quite tricky. Um, it's an improved way of doing tracheal intubation. OK, this is necessary when you're putting something down someone's throat for the purpose of intubating them, uh, either because you're uh, putting them to sleep because you're anesthetizing them for surgery, for example, or in the case of COVID-19, you're trying to save their life through either um, an emergency intubation in some way. And um, what Judith Wang did is she made small improvements to his software and his paper and presented a poster session of this at an IEEE conference in Pittsburgh. Um, so it was mostly Eric's idea, but Judith made some important contributions to it. Um, next, I, I'd like to present uh, Nathaniel's holding up his plaque here. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, a very important word award of best technical paper. And this was a long time coming. Uh, for the Polyvent educational platform. Um, uh, Nathaniel, as you can see, is a young man. I think he's still 19. He started working on this with Dr. Victor Sutrin at the height of the pandemic when he was 16. And um, despite his youth, he was legitimately the lead engineer of the Polyvent ventilator for all of the hardware electronics. I did a lot of the, the software, but he did even a lot of the 3D CAD design, although, uh, as you saw in the previous montage, a number of other people have uh, helped. And the polyvent ventilator was really the, the heart of the um, free Spirico system that public invention has been, been working on for a long time. So thank you, Nathaniel. Um, so best public inventor, third place goes to Jeff Mulligan. Uh, Jeff worked with me and Lawrence and Lee on the NASA system. He's a very senior electrical engineer who previously volunteered for 
the Ventmon project and did a lot of other things at the height of the pandemic. I should point out that in general, public invention volunteers don't get paid. Um, Jeff Lee Lawrence, Jeff Lee and Lawrence were paid by the, for the NASA project because we had money coming in from NASA. But most of the people we're awarding today, um, including myself, do not get compensated by public invention. Um, so second place is Lawrence Kinchelow, um, who's really a, a brilliant person. He's involved in a lot of different things. He's an artist. Um, he's interested in analog computing. And he did both hardware and software on the NASA um, medical ceramic oxygen generation uh, thing. Uh, I'm sorry, digital control system. He's also acted as an invention coach in some cases. Um, and now um, I'd like to ask Lee to say a few words in just a minute. Um, Forrest Lee Erickson gets one of the most important awards we give out, best invention coach. At Public Invention, we don't separate managers from mentors as is done at other organizations. Um, we think in terms of public inventors and invention coaches and invention coaches are not the most important. It's the public inventors who are really doing the work, but invention coaches are the way that public invention is going to grow. We can't run more projects than we have invention coaches for. And so Lee has allowed us to take on more projects and, and also Lawrence um, and myself. So if you're listening to this or you see this on YouTube and you're capable of being an invention coach, which means you understand something technical, you're willing to manage a project and you can inspire people, then please send me email and potentially volunteer. Um, so uh, Lee, would you please say a few words? Well, I... I'm fond of telling people I'm the luckiest person that has ever lived because Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong took me with them to the moon, and I've been excited about technology before that and ever since. And I've had good mentors in my career, and I hope that I can uh, mentor and inspire others uh, and share that luck. Thank you. And you have, I think. Um, so now I'd, I'd like to present an award to Melanie Laporte, uh, the best new public inventor. Um, so Melanie ha has really embodied what we're trying to do at Public Invention because she's gone from like zero knowledge in the last um, year about electronics to designing her own printed circuit board. And that's the printed circuit board that's being used in the new um, Moonrat system, the, the portable incubator that we we're talking about. Uh, she told me that that uh, she was a little sick earlier. Melanie, are you, you here? Would you like to say a few things? Okay, I can't hear you, so we'll come back to you, um, maybe. Now, now, I don't know if, if Harry is here. Um, the highest award presented by Public Invention goes to Harry Pearson, best public inventor for global distributed tracking. Um, Harry is a ruthlessly competent humanitarian engineer, and he did that before he joined Public Invention. But he wrote a, a minimum viable product for global distributed tracking in about a week based on my notes. And since then, uh, he and I have been architects of the global distributed tracking team. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to work with Harry. Harry, if you're here, would you like to uh, come off mic and say something? Possibly he's not here, so I'm going to go on. Um, now, Dale, if you can get ready, I'm very honored to have Dale Doherty here, um, who I knew about 20 years ago, but um, started to interact with just a little bit at the beginning of the pandemic, because uh, Dale is sometimes called the father of the maker movement. He created the Maker Fairs Worldwide and Make Magazine, uh, which is a favorite of mine. Here's the latest version of Make Magazine. Um, during the pandemic, he created a system for trying to get um, makers to address the serious health problems produced by the COVID-19 pandemic. And my board, uh, the Board of Public Invention, asked me to do the same thing, which led to the Ventmon and eventually the Polyvent being taken on by um, Public Invention. Uh, he's written two books that I'd like to plug. 
um, free to make how the maker movement is changing our minds and maker city, a practical guide for reinventing American, uh, cities. So, um, with that, uh, Dale, if you're here, could you please, um, maybe take over? Yes. Can you hear me? Let me, uh, I need we to share a screen. There we go. Well, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. That's such an awesome roster of uh, people that you've given awards to. Um, I, uh, I'm humbled by just seeing that work. And, and I, I think in this presentation, I just want to see more of that. I think there's a need for it. And, uh, you know, uh, just to give you a little background, I started Make in 2005. The magazine came first and then a year later, the um, uh, first Maker Fair in the Bay Area. Um, and we had produced those up until about 2019. And then 20, the, you know, COVID hit and, uh, you know, a lot of the fairs went away and they've been coming back. I was glad to see Robert and, and Christine at um, the Maker Fair. Uh, Bay Area at Mare Island in, in October. But, um, you know, the purpose of this talk is to sort of talk more about makerspaces and about any of us, but makerspaces sort of emerge out of this. They're in Fab Labs, makerspaces, hackerspaces, they're all kind of the same uh, makeup. Um, uh, and I kind of started working on makerspaces in about 2010 because I saw them as a need for edu in education. That, you know, in other words, the shop class was gone, and a lot of practical applied learning was missing. And I thought, well, let's let's uh, try to create spaces where um, young people can have experience using tools and developing projects. So um, I'll get started here. I um, hmm, let's see. There we go. I like monster movies as a kid <laughs> and uh, particularly the old ones that were in black and white. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in November last year, uh, uh, a remake of uh, original Godzilla came out. It's called Godzilla minus one. Um, the original was 1959. Um, and, and this one though, kind of uh, the director said he was sort of inspired by COVID, although he didn't set it in this time period. Um, it, it, he said it after World War II, it's just ended, and Godzilla is rampaging through the cities, um, through the city of Tokyo, and the government's in disarray, and the, and the military is disbanded. There's really no clear way to organize a group to, you know, take on Godzilla. And there's a great scene in the movie where, you know, a group of citizens in kind of a town hall meeting looks like a classroom uh, they're they're gonna they realize they have to figure out something on their own, and uh, an an engineer whose character's name in the movie is uh, Kinji Noda. He gets up in front. He has kind of tousled hair. He's kind of quiet, but he says, you know, he could come up with a plan to destroy Godzilla at sea, and it probably doesn't really matter in the plot and everything what his plan is. Um, but they need a plan, and they think his is is a good one to try. Um, but this, uh, actually, there's a slide there, that, that's Kenji Noda. But, you know, it was kind of uh, interesting and in that it wasn't the military, it wasn't the government, it was just civilians coming together, bringing their expertise to, to help solve the problem. And this really reminded me of the what I call the civic response to, to COVID. Um, I called it Plan C. And contrary to Robert, I just thought it was a good story and it needed to be told. I, these things were happening. Many people were doing interesting things, including open source medical supplies, which I think it was the, 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 the premier group here. But um, I was just amazed at what makers were doing. And I, I thought uh, they had kind of, at the same time, in the same ways, decided to do things to benefit their own community, um, particular, you know, the medical workers. And I, I, I really wanted to highlight that this maker community was um, able to work together to share designs and, and, and get the job done. And, you know, was, in many ways, it was a perfect demonstration of what in some ways had been a theory of Neil Gershenfeld's the Fab Lab was that, you know, digital designs, fabrications are files that can go anywhere. And then you need the equipment locally to produce things. 
And so whether it was a rural community in Tennessee or Montana or a big city in Chicago, you know, people were, were taking equipment and, and making um, PPE. Um, one of the, my favorite ones was Artisan's Asylum. Um, and, and I did a piece called An Asylum Saves Us. And uh, what was interesting here to me was this is a maker space in Somerville, Massachusetts, kind of about 10 years old. Um, and uh, has a nice connection. Guy Cavalcanti, who started Open Source Medical Supplies, was the founder of, of Artisan's Asylum um, uh, back in about 2010 or 12, something like that. But uh, his current director is Lars Torres. And he talked about how they actually had to change how they operate, how they thought about themselves. You know, maker spaces are kind of creative spaces. People come in and do their own work and they mingle with each other. But to be able to produce PPE, they had to work as teams. They had to produce something. Um, and, and so it, it didn't really lend itself to everybody working independently. Instead, they had to collaborate and form groups and they had to make decisions and they had to meet production schedules. So um, let's show you. Uh, one of the people in there, uh, Sarah Miller, uh, worked on hospital gowns and, and she said, can you make something we've never made before and show other people how to make it? You know, so she had to not only design something, but she had to come up with a production process to do that. Um, and again, I, some of you are probably really familiar with these stories, but I kind of felt four years after this, I just, this is history that needs to be living for us because it it does matter. Tim Butterworth, he, he built... Um, he designed a pleating tool to help fold surgical masks. You know, no medical experience, no no background in this, but there was a need to 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 create pleats, and he used three D printing to do it. But he said, you know, once they got up with running, the most inspiring thing was coming in and seeing so many people, you know, to, with you know just wanting to help their community. And I think a huge part of the civic response effort is people want to help; they want to get involved. And so how do you structure that? Um, and, and I think makerspaces in, in many cases had a, not just their members, but also volunteers and other people in, in the community. I wanna mention again, open source medical supplies played such an important role during the pandemic as a coordinating body for information and people and projects. And they also acted, I think, as a kind of moral compass for the community, discerning good information from bad and even good government actions from bad uh, as well. Um, and, you know, as time went on, they began to get some level of funding and, and, and get organized. But I think it is a really important role for organizations who coordinate the work, but don't necessarily do all the work themselves. Um, and I don't think we've um, really, I was hopeful that folks like the U.S. government would recognize what happened during COVID and say, boy, we ought to plan for this. I'm reading a book called The Big Fail, which was put out in, in November um, by Joan O'Sara and Beverly McLean. It's it's on, you know, America's response to COVID and in many cases, the, you know, bad decisions that were made uh, largely because of politics. And I, I, I they wrote a book on the 2008 uh, economic collapse. And and I have a feeling this book won't be as popular as their other book. Like I don't, I, for some reason, the mood of the country isn't wanting to go back and look at these things and say, could they be better? I want to sort of bring up another example. This is this is a, a maker's desk in Ukraine, um, and he's making. Um, well, they they, they sometimes um, call them tails. Uh, they are uh, grenade tails that they would put a grenade inside these gray objects and they would drop them from a drone onto the field. And um, uh, so in, in Ukraine, they have, you know, the maker community is is really actively involved in, in with the military. I mean, in other words, they are working in the military, they're working outside the military, building tank bar barricades, building, you know, modifying equipment, uh, drones and other things like that. And, and it, it's really pretty interesting. Uh, um, but um, but maker spaces are, have been really valuable. This is makers. Uh, this is Hack Lab in Kiev. This is a group that's making um, uh, lights, electric lights. Uh, 
um, for actually in this case, a veterinary clinic. Um, so one of the things that really points out here is that there's a real need to train people during an emergency, not just the people that can do it already, but getting new people to be able to do things. And I think one of the roles makerspaces have had in this war um, is, is training people even for civilian purposes. So one is, is sort of giving 3D printing classes and and uh, a lot of people who would never walk into a makerspace now walk in and want training because they want to help. Um, these are a couple other people in the hack lab um, in Kiev. A woman on the left, Olga, had, uh, before, before the war started, she had a jewelry design business, ma made her own jewelry. She had workers actually doing that. And those workers were men who went off as soldiers to fight the war. She didn't have anybody to make her jewelry and make a living. So she went to, to hack lab to learn to weld and, and do other things. Um, in Ukraine, um, they conducted a survey last year and about 196, you know, Ukrainian makers identified and that they needed, you know, more training and interest in 3D printing. And there are about 18 maker spaces across Ukraine as of last year. They, um, as of March uh, 2nd this year, they produced a maker fair in Kyiv during the war. Um, it was a pretty amazing uh, accomplishment. On the, on the right, the gentleman is uh, Yuri Velostek. He's kind of been the maker leader in, in, in Ukraine, uh, producing maker fairs and trying to coordinate lots of different work and 3D printing conferences and, and such. So um, um, this is an older example, but uh, from Haiti, uh, humanitarian makers have also, I think, tried to in effect, um, bring maker spaces into disaster areas. And one of the lessons I find interesting is if you can get the local people involved in solving their own problems, learning how to use 3D printers or other technologies, rather than just giving them a solution, getting them involved in learning the skills to develop the solution themselves. So, you know, what have we learned? And I, I think this is Lars Torres from Artisans Asylum. He said, maker spaces are essential because they, they enable community resilience. Um, and I, as I said, I kind of hoped we'd come out of, out of COVID with the government really saying, how do we build the capacity to, to solve problems um, like this in the future? And it hasn't really happened, but the maker spaces in general have come back. They're doing, you know, some have closed, but in general, they're doing pretty well. Um, they're building up um, uh, communities. So I, what I kind of just wanted to, you know, I, I think summarize here is I have a vision that makerspaces could be a kind of civic lab. And, 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 and by that, I mean, in the spirit of a public invention, Robert was talking about it. These are places where people can go to create things and do things. Sometimes they don't have the equipment. They don't have the skills to do prototyping, but they could learn to do that. They do often have ideas about a particular problem that's not being solved. A friend of mine, uh, Tom Igo, who teaches at, at uh, NY, uh, ITP program in Iowa, uh, at, uh, at NYU, he said he was about, he realized that he wanted to be about projects, not platforms. And I think we all, um, different organizations have to make choices about that. I think makerspaces are about projects. They're not really platforms. I think organizations like Public Invention and, and OSMS can be seen as platforms that connect lots of maker spaces together that help to launch uh, projects that could take contributors from many different places. And I mentioned the importance of training. Um, I, I think it's, it's kind of an under discussed thing, but how do you get more people learning how to, how to solve problems and to participate in, in these activities? Um, and, and I think the interdisciplinary nature of makerspaces is an asset. It's not aligned by fields and subjects and degrees. Uh, I think that allows us to organize people and resources to solve problems in their own communities. And whoops, I got training in here twice. Sorry. And, and, um, and I think that that role, as I said, of different organizations, um, one of the big challenges I think so far is you know, uh, the funding community doesn't want to give money to, to maker spaces to do projects. Um, and I, I wonder if organizations uh, uh, that might network them together might be able to get that funding 
and 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 uh, and then tap into maker spaces, you know, for R and D projects. One idea I've always had is in the community, you know, could could we I could we have a a, a problem finding or discovery process that just collects problems, right, without necessarily saying how or who they're going to get solved. And then, you know, maybe the top problems, there's government agencies willing to attack those problems. There's always lo low priority problems. I mean, this is true of a corporation as well as anything else. How could you get makerspaces attacking low priority problems? They still need to be solved. They shouldn't be low priority forever, but there may be people in the community that want to do that. So, um, you know, I, I think there's plenty of, problems in the world and and maker spaces and their members could be part of a long-term strategy for solving all kinds of problems um and i think it just again in the spirit of public invention some are deeply technical problems and some are kind of social and cultural problems you know and how do you deploy technology how do you get people doing it one of the interesting things i think in the humanitarian area sometimes is um it's it's like having the instructions for how to make something can be really valuable, right? That's tested, not just have the device itself. Like you can get the materials locally and make it. I heard once from someone saying they went to Africa and he said he was seeing they'd have a, a copy of Make Magazine and an account with Alibaba. They'd order things and make products like a solar charger and then be able to sell them in their own community. So we have plenty of problems and, you know, Godzilla's coming. <laughs> so thank you very much. I appreciate uh, um, talking to you and I wish you all the best. Well, thank you very much. Um, so we we have, yeah, let's give a round of applause to Dale if you can emote using whatever <laughs> mechanism you have uh, to emote here. Um, I have a number of questions for Dale, but I'd rather t uh, let the audience have five minutes to ask questions of Dale um, for myself. I just want to point out uh, open source medical supplies, I think of as a sister organization to public convention. Christina Cole and Victoria Jacqua, who are here, um, are the driving force behind open source medical supplies. You can find them and talk to them, find them online and, and send a note to them uh, if, if you want. Um, Megan or Miriam uh, has posted here in the chat the link to the 79 research problems which Public Invention has identified. So we have far more projects than we have invention coaches to work on. Um, and we've done some of what Dale has suggested, which is we've just collected problems. And some of them are frankly half-baked and some of them are fully baked. You know, some of them are active research project and some of them are just ideas um many of them are mine but not all of them lawrence has contributed several uh and there are you know maybe probably 15 of them are from other people and what public invention wants to do based on what dale said is to be the research arm of the maker movement right like we want to do what the makers do but in in the realm of doing real research that gets published and intersects what universities uh, do. And when he was talking about coordinating, I think that's extremely important uh, because it's something that I spend a lot of time doing and I'd probably rather be doing something else. But you know, you need organizations that are mature enough to assist people in coming together because Projects don't manage themselves, and you can't create a nonprofit if you don't do the paperwork. You know, um, the the motto of the lawful good person is kicking ass and filling out all the proper forms, right? So that's what public invention does, right? We do that um, so that we can form teams. And you've seen a few of the teams in our talk today, but we'd like to form more. If we had more volunteers and more public inventors, we could form more teams. So um, uh, who wants to ask a question of Dale? You can either chat it into the chat system here uh, and I'll moderate it or just come off mic and speak it. Go ahead, Christina. 
Yes, Dale, that was excellent. Thank you. And I, I share the same feelings on um, kind of that sense of hoping that the government would have taken a little more notice around uh, the maker movement specific to the pandemic. And that kind of ties into my question is, are there other times, um, either in modern or slightly less modern history in which you're aware of a large maker response. The only one that comes to mind is something we talked a lot about in the earlier days of OSMS was kind of the domestic response to World War II efforts in terms of manufacturing here in the U.S. Um, but I, I'd be curious to hear your your take on that. No, I, I don't really know of anything equivalent, uh, Christina. In in the but I have a couple of things I just I've looked at to see if they're sort of close. You know there are mechanic. There's one in Sebastian uh, in San Francisco. It's a mechanics institute, and there was a, a time when they formed. I think in the late uh, 19th century around you know providing um, libraries, meeting places for people who were in the trades, um, so that you know to some degree they could develop as people. Right, um, uh, not just as workers, and um, and um, and so I, I, there's a little history there, um, but I haven't necessarily. Um, I there's, you know, what I have found is is like in the '60s, you know, so like uh, Chevrolet, which I write about in my book, you know, had an industrial video called "American Maker," you know, and it was touting all the ways, and it was kind of traditional, but all the ways Americans make things and how they were proud of that. And it was part of who they were and who, who the country stood for. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think part of what I'm trying to get across at a simple, almost cultural level is how do we be, you know, how do we encourage people to become producers, not just consumers? How, how do they, and I think it's so important even in the software world that we live in, I just wrote something yesterday. It's, it's like in some ways we're being told that, um, that that it doesn't take any work to do anything. You know, we can just use AI to create something. And we, we you know, we, we almost don't have to exert ourselves in ways that, that, um, that I think are important. Yeah. Let me, let me stop there. You know, one thing about makers is that it's always just a joyous thing to make something. Yeah. You know, it's such a wonderful thing uh, just to make things. And Make Magazine, for for example, often features like um, knitting and fiber arts thing that are not electronic gadgets, right? It, it covers a, a wide variety of, of making, even though we're here. I see that Stephanie, uh, who's a board member at Public Invention, has her hand up. But Dr. Abadi uh, asked a question that I'd like to read to you, Dale. Um, what are some of the coolest things you've seen in makerspaces? What are some, some things we should do to keep our makerspaces up to date? And this is coming from a professor at Rice University that runs one of the coolest makerspaces. Uh, yeah, I I visited the, uh, the the design kitchen down there, and yeah, and and uh, uh, I always want to say it's OCD, but it's OCKD. I think it is something like that. Um, so thanks Osmond for the question. And design kitchen. It's right, cool. right. Um, you know, I, I, I'll give you a different kind of answer to this. I think it's the people. When I go into makerspace and see people doing stuff and the kind of people that are there, that makes me really happy to talk to them and find out, um, you know, who they are, what, how they got there, what their interests are. And, um, so, you know, keeping makerspaces up to date, um, you know, there's there's sort of a an obsession sometimes around equipment, but it's it's really uh, I think important to ask about who are the people that are in the makerspace helping other people and and are they up to date on you know like like I love the word coach for instance um, we're talking about inventor coaches we need maker coaches that can help other people learn to do things and I think it's a particular skill that's distinct from teaching it's coaching. Um, which means encouragement, which means, uh, you know, helping people do things themselves, not doing it for them and, and um, you know, keeping their, their, their spirit up there. So I think that's the most, the people are, uh, 
you know, I, and, and again, from my early days in doing this, what I liked is you'd find people that were dropouts of engineering schools. They went to engineering to build something and it was a bunch of math and they weren't happy. So they left and they were just going to do it on their own. Um, but you'd also see people with PhDs in there who weren't, you know, I, I just wrote something about a, a person in San Francisco. She says she's a coder by day and a maker by moonlight. You know, So um there, I found it an interesting uh, makers are sometimes, you know, they work in industry, they they might have technical jobs, but they do, they're making kind of because it's their thing. And I, I talked about in a column recently, indie makers, I call them, someone used that phrase at Maker Fair, and I really liked it, is, you know, they get to decide what to do and that what interests they have and what project to do. And, and often that drives me. In fact, you know, you were talking about spirometers earlier. And I'm not a technical person, but I knew what that meant because I gave a talk at a high school and a 15 year old girl came up and said, you know, my maker project was to create a spirometer. And I said, well, why'd you create a spirometer? She says, well, I have asthma and I only can go to the doctor once every, you know, couple months and they measure my lungs. I wanted to know because I wanted to run. I wanted to play sports and other things. I wanted to know what my breathing was like after those activities. So I wanted to build a portable spirometer that I could use myself. So, you know, even though we talk about it being their own interest, it doesn't mean that it doesn't overlap with other things that are significant. Um, safety you issues in maker spaces. You know, uh, Jen, thank you for the question. I, I have worried about that a little bit in the past, but it, uh, uh, it the number of occurrences is actually quite small. Um, I, I've tried to talk to people about it. I do think it's one of those areas that should be standardized across makerspaces. You should have, you know, like a yellow book of safety that everybody uses and a safety monitoring team and a, and then every, and a safety officer and everything like that. It doesn't happen in makerspaces. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it 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 has some places have quite detailed things, and some spaces uh, are are kind of like a cordoned off, like you can't get into the CNC machine unless you have um, you know access key, and that access key is checking to see if you have taken the safety training. So people have come up with their own things. Um, you know, one of the interesting things compared to shop classes, shop classes in the past, they do like six weeks of safety training before you ever touched a machine. And we just can't do that in makerspaces. You kind of have safety all the time or, uh, uh, you know, on drip, you know. Um, but but uh, makerspaces usually have some basic safety training in there. Uh, Stephanie. Stephanie. Sorry, Stephanie, didn't get to you earlier. Oh, no worries. Uh, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. Um thank you. Sorry, that's my daughter in the background. Um, so uh, I was, obviously you've built this sort of like amazing movement and community. What are like the biggest lessons that you think you can sort of impart to the public invention community about creating community? Like what have you found that has been the most impactful or unexpected or just has like worked the best for you? Well, I'll tell you one of the basic principles that I've been guided by. Um, in doing events like Maker Fair, is I'm not trying to get anybody to do things for me. I'm trying to find out what they're already doing and seeing if they'll come and share it. In other words, um, motivation matters quite a bit. And, um, you know, and, and somebody say, hey, why don't you do a theme on sustainability? And I go, well, I don't know if Maker, you know, I'll look for it. You know, I'll look for makers doing that. But I don't know, um, you know, it's up to them. I can't you know, I don't, I never felt like I could push an agenda on makers. They have their own creative interests. And the good side of that is you find much better things than I would have ever thought of to go look for. <laughs> so uh, like that, you know, you know, the high school student doing a spirometer, you know, um, she could ask me all day long what she should do. And I would have never come up with that idea. Okay. Um, design files, Victoria, I'll have to check. Uh, it's a couple of years ago. It's certainly before COVID that she did this, but she created a product. Um, you know, she, she, uh, she did, um, 
wanted to market it, but I, I she was such a smart girl. I'm so sure she went on to find other other projects as well. You know, what I would like to see is that no one has to feel like they're working alone. Yeah. You know, that if you're making a spirometer, you're joining the worldwide spirometer production team. And yeah. whether you're joining as a junior partner because you're in high school or a senior partner because you've, you've done it for 10 years, uh, you know, there's really only one set of human knowledge, which is being advanced. And there's room for everybody in that program. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, I, um, I, I agree. You know, the openness is so important. Um, you know, it, it kind of, I think, is part of the open source DNA of the maker movement and, and you know, going back to free software, as you mentioned earlier, um, that, 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 you know, I, I always say, like, the default is to share. You don't have to share, but the default is, you know, share it um, if, if you don't have any other, you know, purpose in it. And, um, but I, I think that happened a little bit during COVID in a good way that we saw people finding each other who, you know, were working on a project. Um, the, the, the one challenge I've always had, and I still think it's uh, still a challenge. I go into maker spaces and I see a project and I go, why doesn't anybody know about that project? And the person says, well, I didn't think anybody was interested or I don't have time to document it or you, you know, all those things. And you go, come on. And so that's why I'm kind of proud of Maker Faire. It's somewhat a, um, it gives people a, a little bit of motivation to do that. You know, it's kind of show and tell is what we call it, is come out and share it and show it and talk to people about it. Because you, then you make those connections. I loved your story about how many people came, you know, with cryptography backgrounds and came up to you and talked to you. That's really amazing. And, um, you know, and I, I always thought if I can get more makers, you know, at, at Maker Faire, Bring your ideas. You're going to find people there. We'll, we'll go deep dive with you on your idea. And you never have figured out how to meet that person in the real world outside of it. You know, and what a benefit it is sometimes just to get have that conversation. That was my original idea of Maker Faire was just to, for people to have a conversation around something they made. You know, not any different than a science fair, art fair, but I didn't want the stiffness of a science fair. I just wanted the conversation of just, you know, let's let people ask good questions. They're curious about it. Right. Right. Well, yeah. And of course you do that through make magazine as well. You feature, yeah. you know, uh, projects and however many people read that magazine, get to see that project and maybe one in a hundred will send an email to the person who uh, yeah. made the Well, project. I always, I mean, in the magazine more so than maker fair, we're trying to create projects that are replicable, you know, that other people can do. Doesn't mean they will do them, but I, I'd like to think that people, even in reading them, you know, figure out something and they hold on to it until they have a project and they go, oh, you know, that project that did this with that. I, I think my idea, you know, is a little bit like that and you, and you kind of clone off it. So it, it, it was one of the goals is, and I think this goes back to the old thing of training, is we've kind of lost some of these skills and how to do things in our society and people in consumer society are kind of helpless. And, and I think, how do you get that DIY back in our culture so people um, begin to solve it? And yes, Victoria, we were so happy to publish um, uh, <laughs> your articles in, in May. Um, okay, well, uh, this is awfully fun, and we could probably talk another hour, but uh, in the, we have a lot of people here, and I said this for an hour or an hour and a half, so um, we should probably thank Dale once again and move on to the other part of our thing. Thank you very <laughs> much. Um, there's more I'd like to yeah. talk to talk about. We didn't get to talk about the interaction between the maker community and universities uh, and, and so forth, but very much. But um, nonetheless, I think it's time to go on. I have one little Thank duty. You. Melanie Laporte is sick, but she asked me to read a speech that she sent in by email because she's coughing. And in honor of her as our best new public inventor, I just want to read her speech. Um, she says here, hello, everyone. Last year witnessed numerous career firsts from wiring a breadboard and deciphering a schematic to designing a printed circuit board. And yes, even enduring my first soldering injury, Painful, but I do cherish the mark. I was able to work closely with invention coach and incredible resource Lee Erickson. 
Each challenge I experience has been a testament to perseverance and passion. Public Invention has changed my life for the better, and I am so grateful to Dr. Reed's support and the entire team of dedicated volunteers. And we're thankful to you, Melanie, as well. Um, there's the there's the PCB. Uh, Lee Erickson is holding up the PCB um, that uh, that she designed. And look, it's live. It's even showing little uh, software things moving across there. Um, and that's all because of um, all because of of uh, Melanie with some help, you know, from people. Okay. So now um, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to just say one more thing, and then I'm going to stop the recording uh, so that we can have a slightly more private um, conversation. I want to thank everybody who's here and everybody who's going to see this on YouTube. Thank you for listening. Um, we need your moral support. We really do. Showing up to an event like this is very valuable. I hope. I hope it makes. Christina and Megan and Miriam and Lee and Lawrence and Jeff and everybody feel honored that people came uh, to, to their award ceremony. We also need people to volunteer. Um, it's been our experience that you have to work six hours a week for six months because on a highly technical team, you just can't keep up if you can't put that much time into it. And that's a high bar. You know, if you can only spend an hour a week on something, there are other projects you can work on, um, but you're not going to be able to keep up with, with one of our teams, unfortunately. Um, and then the other thing we need is money. And we need money for two reasons. So first of all, public invention is extremely efficient. Its founder, me, receives no compensation from public invention. Most of the people who were given an award tonight do not receive uh, compensation unless we have money coming in specifically for a project, in which case we send it out to those volunteers. Most of the money we get, we spend on equipment and absolutely necessary services like our um, legal fees and hosting fees and 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 that kind of uh, that that kind of thing. Um, the other thing about money is that it shows the IRS that we are a publicly supported charity. So we really need donations, even if they're small, from a lot of people in order to show the IRS that we are not a private foundation. And that's one reason I'm not ashamed to ask for money um, from all the people here. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can find our donation uh, thing, link on our website and make a donation there. Now I'm going to stop recording.